shoulder instability now shoulder instability grossly is divided into anterior posterior and multidirectional instabilities the crux of our work is anterior instability approximately 80 to 90 percent of the cases will fall into anterior instability some of the cases will be posterior instability and some will be a multidirectional instability so we'll be discussing the whole spectrum of instability the first and the foremost thing to understand is that is number one is you need to uh, know the cause of the instability so that is very important so what is causing the instability and because and because of what lesion instability is coming so anteriorly if we talk about so you can have an injury to the labrum which can cause a instability and this anterior inferior labral tear is called as the bancard tear now this can be associated with a bony component so that is called as a bony bancard so what are the types of bony bancard so bony bancard is also of two types you can have a fracture bancard or you can have a attrition bancard so what is the difference between the two acute cases so, so you will have a bone fragment so if you have a bone fragment which is there then it is a bony fractured bancard so what is happening is suppose that if this is a glenoid there will be a bony fracture like this and there will be a bone here and bone here so that is a bony bancard with a bony fragment or a loose bony fragment and sometimes you will not have this bone but this will be worn off so that will, that is called as an attrition bony bancard so these are all these are also two different different scenarios in which you can have a bone loss along with a uh, attrition or fracture now there can be a mixed picture also which means that there is a bone fragment and there is a attrition also and this is very important when you are planning your treatment so if there is a bancard or a labral tear the treatment is straightforward you fix the labrum and you are fine if there is a bony bancard then, then there is a controversy so maximum studies or maximum doctors will actually operate up to 15% bone loss as a soft tissue procedure like a bancard labral repair if it is more than 15 to 20 it's a debatable or a controversial zone more than 20 almost there is a consensus that you need to do some sort of a bony procedure now if this is a fractured fragment and if this is an attrition that you need to actually calculate the attrition to find out whether you need a bone block procedure or a lethargic or not so supposedly there is a bone loss of around 25% and you have a 10% bone fragment remaining then the effective bone loss will be around 15% so that is probably manageable with a soft, soft, soft tissue procedure or actually the fixation of the bone fragment back to the yeah. level but if this fragment is like 5% then you might have to do a bone block procedure or lethargy in this case because the effective bone loss is much more than 15 percent so if this bone fragment is big and it is not associated with a significant uh, attrition you can fix it up but if it is associated with attrition and more than 15 percent of actual bone wear or loss then you need to do some kind of a bony block procedure now there are lots of bony block procedures which are described and will be coming to that in the end so we read this until the end now the next lesion is what is called as an elpsa lesion what is elpsa lesion so you have a glenoid like this okay and you have a labrum attached here okay so this labrum with repeated dislocations will migrate to anterior rim of the or anterior neck of the glenoid so finally it will be lying up somewhere around here and this needs to be elevated when you are doing your labrum or bancard so this is called as an elpsa lesion that is the anterior labral periosteal sleeve aversion injury so the labrum and the capsular complex tear away and it heals on the neck of the glenoid okay similar to that is a lesion which is called as a gland lesion what is a gland lesion gland lesion is a glenoid labral tear with an articular defect so you have an injury of the labrum and then you have a cartilage loss in this vicinity. 
So you have a cartilage loss along with the lateral tear. And this is again at the same location where the Benkart tear is. Now many a times you will have a slap lesion which is associated with your Benkart lesion. So you have a sleeve of labrum which is torn anteriorly and it goes up to superiorly. So that is also sometimes accompanying with your anterior instability. And if it is there, you need to fix that as well. Then is the heel sex lesion. Heel sex lesion is basically a dent on the posterior lateral local head because of the dislocation. Now this is again a debatable uh, issue whether to address it and how to classify it. Initial classifications given by Barkhat is engaging and non-engaging lesions. So they say that if the lesion is engaging, then you need to do an emphasized procedure. If it is not engaging, you can just leave it and go away with the bank card procedure. Then, then there, is a, there was a concept of on-track and off-track lesions. And this you need to read a lot about it. There is a lot of controversy. But overall, by and large, I am more aggressive. So if there is a heel sex lesion, which is significant, I would go ahead and do an emphasized surgery in most of my labral repairs or bank card repairs. So that is up to the tune of around 90%. So only if there is a very very small insignificant hill sex, I will just leave it. So around 10 to 15 percent of my cases, I will not do a ramp research and I will just do a lateral or a bed cut repair. Now, a uh, opposite of this lesion is what is called as a Hegel lesion. So this is the labral tear is from the glenoid. The other end of the capsule is towards the humerus. So the same injury can occur from the humeral side also. And that is called as, if the capsule is above from the glenoid side, along with labrum, it is called a bad lesion. If the, lesion, the injury occurs at the other side, that is called as a hangal lesion. That is called as a humeral avulsion of glenohumeral ligament. And this needs to be addressed with an anchor on the humerus. Okay. This bad and labral tear be addressed on the glenoid. Now this uh, uh, Hegel lesion you can address it arthroscopic and you can occasionally address it open. So if you want to do an arthroscopy, you have to be a little bit more like just like you repair your subscap, you put your anchors at around the same location and try to repair the Hegel. Now the question is how do you identify a Hegel lesion? If you are able to see the subscapularis muscle fibers straightforward when you go in, then there is no capsule in the front. When you go in the shoulder, you will have a capsule and behind the capsule you have subscap. So if the capsule falls back, you will see subscap directly along with the muscle fibers. Straight, you, you go in, there is no capsule. And then you have to hold with your grasper and when you pull it, you will be able to see just like a comma sign. But in comma sign, it is with the subscap. This is the capsule only. So capsule only will be, you will be see, able to see it lying separately. Its range is not that common, it is less than I think 4-5% of the total anterior instability work. But you should have a knowledge about this equation and if you are not well versed with the arthroscopy, you can always treat it open. So use an open uh, open surgery, just do a not me of the subscap, fix anchors and repair the capsule and repair the subscap. So you can address that occasionally open also. Now coming to the posterior instability. Posterior instability is basically more commonly seen in these two subgroups, electric shock and epilepsy. Now this does not mean that electric shock and epilepsy cannot cause anterior dislocation. With the electric shock and with an epilepsy, the more common instability is anterior. But it is rare to have a posterior instability without these two. And then there is one more thing that I let you. The other thing is a direct contact sports. So a direct contact sport. So what that means is a something which is hitting to directly like this. So it occasionally help, uh, happens in those rugby players or uh, football players if pushing and pulling like uh, action. And occasionally it happens in cricket. And how the mechanism is actually in the batting, in the batting, not in the bowling. So if the ball comes very fast and the shoulder jerks back. Then the humeral head will push the labrum back. So occasionally during the cricket, batting injuries, if it goes up to the shoulder goes forcibly posteriorly, you can have a posterior instability of a posterior leg Okay. So don't go with the, the uh, feeling finding the epilepsy will always have a posterior dislocation. With epilepsy, more common dislocation is still anterior. Okay. Now you can have a posterior bank tear or a posterior labral tear, or you can have a reverse angle. You can have a capsular lesion also, 
from the humerus or you can have a benign lesion. Again, you can have a bone loss here, but here it is usually not that significant. Bone loss is usually not that significant part here. Now, MDI, that is a multi-directional instability, is usually seen in patients who have collagen diseases, who have legs, who can have ehlers danlos syndrome, something like that. The important classical finding is a sulcus sign. So these patients will have a sulcus sign. So if you pull this, pull the shoulder down, you will have a sulcus here, and they will be instable in the direction. Occasionally they will show you, okay, I can dislocate my shoulder like this. And then these are the MDI patients. And these will have a lax capsule. You will not have a labral tear, backcard tear or something. But actually the capsule is pendulous and lax. Uh, these are traditionally sp spoken as a non-surgical patient. You should avoid operating them without giving a very good chance to try. So these patients, physiotherapy, 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 rehabilitation is the key. Very occasionally in few patients you might consider doing a capsule application but that is the last option, last resort only after doing a very good capsule. That is a, again it, itself a big topic in itself. So what do you do if the patient has a bone loss which is more than 15%? So there are many surgeries which are described and you can take a lot of bone grafts to compensate that. The classical surgery described is what is called as a lethargic. The second most common graft is iliac crest. The third most common graft, which is used worldwide, not very common in India, is a distal tibia allograft. Distal tibia allograft. And the newest in this list is what is called as a scapular spine. So all have their advantages and disadvantages. Most commonly performed is lethargic. So lethargic, you all know, is by acting by three principles. First is it will give a bone itself. There is a sling effect because of the conjoint tendon. Conjoint tendon is made up of. So they will together make a sling effect. So they will be acting like a sling when the shoulder goes into a throwing position. So sling effect. And then you repair the capsular labral complex also. So these are the three features of lethargic. And if you talk grossly, lethargic procedure has got a least rates of dislocation, re-dislocation. But there are some technical issues in lethargic. So you need to fix it with screws. And chances of complications, any sort of complications, is much higher in lethargic as compared to an arthroscopic backyard. Which includes uh, during the surgery, you may have uh, neurological injuries like injury to the musculocutaneous nerve or uh, other uh, important nerves. Then the graft related and the implant related issues. So you can have graft resorption, you can have screw weakness, you can have failure of the screw, you can have proud screws, you can have proud graft. The proud graft may lead to a more chances of osteoarthritis. Okay, so there, let us say, is as far as the Chances of dislocation is concerned, it is a very good surgery, but then you need to do it with precision and there are the chances of complication associated with detached surgery is, is much more. The other options, iliac crest is again a very good graft, but you don't get the sling effect. Uh, but you can do it, you can fix it nicely, it's, you get a big, big fragment, big piece. And you can fix it either with the screws or with the button that is described. So we will coming on to the fixation method of bone loss. Distal tibia allograft not very commonly available in India, but it's a very good graft and it matches the cartilage. So the cartilage is also there. In these two, you don't get the cartilage. With distal tibia allograft, you get the cartilage also. So that is the advantage. So there is a smooth uh, covering of the cartilage over there. The last one is what I do is a scapular spine. So this is, you take it from the shoulder itself, posteriorly with a small incision. You get it around 2 cm by 1 cm good sized graft and you fix it arthroscopically with either you can use uh, uh, lasso tapes or you can uh, you can use what is called as a loop lock tapes or a insert clutch or you can use buttons on both sides okay now all these bone block procedures can be done with two predominant techniques screw and Buttons or a answer clutch, fiber tip answer clutch. The screw technique is a classically described technique. It is said to be better as compared for the shear forces. 
but button technique is again evolving. So if you talk about the history, Letarget, described by Letarget, it was popularized by a French surgeon called as Gilles Walsh. And if you do open Letarget, open Letarget, it is the Gilles Walsh technique which is the most commonly popular technique which is done by surgeons. Now, when the arthroscopy started, there were two major surgeons who are doing these procedures. One was Dr. Laurent Lafos. So he was popularized, he popularized the arthroscopic Letarget with two screws and it is a debut instrumentation and you use the graph with two screws. The second uh, prominent surgeon was Dr. Pascal Boyo and he actually popularized the button technique. So he what, what he does is he, he fixes the coracoid with a fiber tape and buttons. So buttons on the both sides and he fixes the coracoid with that. So that is a more flexible fixation and they, it says that it gives a better compression. But it is not good in the correct in the shear forces. So it is still debatable whether fixation with the screw is better or with the fixation of a buttons or a fiber tape etc. is better. What I personally do at present now is I will do a scapular spine bone block in most of my patients because the advantages are it's a, it's a graph which is available from the same shoulder. So you get an epsilateral graph harness. You don't have to use an India crest. You don't uh, violate the anterior anatomy of the shoulder, which is normal. So your coracoid, your conjointed and everything remains pristine. They remain virgin. And you can harvest it to a normal size in most of the cases. Rarely, if you feel that your bone loss is too much, more than 25%, then you may consider doing a lethargy or a dead crest bone uh, graft. Uh, digital even anyway is not available in India. So, uh, my protocol, most of the cases I will do a scapular spine bone block with a, 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 a fiber tape and supplies or a, some sort of a loop block tapes and that will actually fix the graft back onto the glenoid, do a compression. The other important advantage of this procedure is you can repair the capsular labral complex as normal as possible. So with this technique, the re repair and fixation is absolutely normal as you do in your bank card there. So that is absolutely normal fixation, which is which we can do. Okay. So these are basically. So this is uh, actually if you see, you see my algorithm, arthroscopic surgery, bankard in most of the cases. If there is a significant uh, um, injury to the humerus, then you do a temporary surge. And if the bone loss is more than fifteen percent and you think it's significant. So I will add a scapular spine bone block. If it is very much significant, you might need to do a, a arthroscopic iliac crest or a retention procedure. With, and if you am doing a bone block, I will preferably use a encircled tape. But I will use a button on the anterior aspect to prevent the cut through of the graft. Okay. Any questions? Thank you.